I'm Jordan Otomo. I work for a satellite imaging startup called Skybox Imaging, and I'm going to be presenting on the use of GNU radio for satellite communications. All right, so a quick outline. First, I'll talk briefly about Skybox, our mission, and how GNU radio fits into it. Um, then I'll go a bit into the design of one of our radios, uh, present a couple of slides on our radio performance, and hopefully show you guys a quick demo, and then conclude with some final thoughts. All right, introduction. All right, so a little bit about Skybox Imaging. We were founded in 2009. We're developing low Earth orbit um, microsatellites for the timely delivery of high resolution satellite imagery. Uh, to date, we, we raised over $90 million. We have about 80 employees, and we're located in Mountain View, California, not far from Matt's shop. All right, a little more about our vision. So. Skybox is really trying to revolutionize the satellite imaging industry in two ways. First, as a satellite company, um, traditionally satellite imaging companies have used a few very large, very expensive satellites to acquire their images. What we're trying to do are, is build um, a constellation of these high resolution, lower cost, um, much smaller satellites. And these, this constellation will provide uh, better coverage and also a uh, better refresh rate overall in comparison to just having a few satellites. Also, we'd like to um, improve the overall end-to-end -end, um, image acquisition and video, or image and video acquisition process. Um, these days, we hope that we'll eventually be able to have users place an order for an image on their iPad or iPhone or some web app, and then hopefully have that image show up in their mailbox at some reasonable time later. And secondly, as a big data company, we're trying to um, expand the amount of information you can actually get out of an image. For example, there's a bunch of um, analytics that we can get out. One thing that we're looking, to is, looking into is car counting in parking lots, for example, which may be useful for um, big retail chains. And we also hope to provide timely global timely global insights to businesses and maybe the government. You imagine one thing that could be extremely useful for is security and also other um, things such as monitoring assets, ships in the ocean, crops and pipelines and things like that. All right, so this is actually a really cool picture. Unfortunately, I had to shrink it down a lot, um, but when you think about a satellite, generally, often what comes to mind first is a satellite for TV. And those satellites orbit the Earth out here at about 36,000 kilometers. <clears throat> and those are geostationary. So what that means is that they orbit the Earth at the same rate that the Earth is rotating about its own axis. So when you look up in the sky, that satellite is fixed and that makes it easy um, in terms of communication for a variety of reasons. First, you get a dish, you point it at the sky, and you never touch it. Um, the signal conditions are normally pretty good. Um, you don't have to deal with Doppler. I mean, one thing you might have to worry about is rain, but other than that, it's pretty, pretty nice. Our orbit is a low Earth orbit, which means that we're down here, or about 600 kilometers. This is good for us because we need to be orbiting the Earth multiple times a day so we can, um, <clears throat> the, the more times we orbit the Earth, the more air we cover and the more images we can produce of interesting places. Um, but this means that we have to deal with pretty dynamic signal conditions. Um, for example, we have Doppler <clears throat> and we have varying SNR and signal strength. And also another thing that we've been having to deal with is offsets due to temperature variation. Um, on orbit, we're planning on seeing up to 40 to 50 degrees Celsius in change, so oscillators move and components tend to do crazy things. All right, so a little detail about our communication subsystem. We have two kinds of radios on our satellite. We have low rate radios, which we are using for um, tracking telemetry and control. And that's basically to talk to the satellite, give it commands, receive telemetry. And we also have a high rate. So th these um, links up here represent the TTNC links. And 
Down here we have high speed data links and those are for downlinking images, videos, and data. Um, for this talk I'll be focusing on the lower rate radios, more specifically the receivers. But, it, <clears throat> but in any case, for our uplink, we have a 16 kilobits per second data rate and we're using FSK. On our downlink, we have, um, we're using an X-band downlink and we have a dual data rate actually. We have a low rate 16 kilobits per second and a high rate 64, 64 kilobits per second link. And we're using differentially encoded BPSK and we have a forward air correction on that. And it's, I guess, if you were re wondering why we have so much redundancy here, um, in terms of low and high data rates, the low data rate just provides extra margin if we need it. Um, decreasing our rate by four effectively gives us six dB more in our link margin. And other reasons for redundancy, obviously, um, actually, it, this should be obvious, but you don't really realize it and think about it until you're working in a satellite imaging company, and that's once this guy goes up there, you're not fixing it. Um, so you need to have some sort of backup plan in, in case something goes wrong. <clears throat> All right, a couple of design considerations that we went through. First, we have limited, um, limited capital in a startup, so cost is very important to us. We can't be shelling out thousands and thousands of dollars for commercial solutions or custom solutions, which would be nice. Secondly, we have time limitations. Um, on the day-to-day -day basis, we, have, we had about three engineers trying to take care of the entire communication systems, all of the radios you saw in the previous slide, and antennas and things of that nature. So we, need to, we, don't, we can't be you know, dedicating all three of us to learn this GNU radio um, and things like that. Um, and also, on a larger scale, we have an extremely aggressive schedule. Um, once you schedule your launch date, that rocket is going to go up whether you're on it or not. So um, <clears throat> we need to be able to meet that. Flexibility. Um, in a startup, our design requirements are frequently changing. And you, someone might come to you one day and ask you, you know, we need, to, we need more data. We need, we need to be able to downlink more data. Or we need a higher rate. We need to change modulation, things like that. So we need to be extra flexible. And also performance. We, need, we don't want to lose the ability to talk to our satellite, so we have to be highly robust, and <clears throat> we'd like to get low implementation loss. All right, so here's a block diagram of our first proposed architecture, and you can see it's kind of clunky. What we have here is a bunch of satellite modems. Um, so we have those high rate and low rate um, downlink modems that or downlink radios that you saw on the um, link side and then we also have that the redundancy that you also saw and then on the bottom we have our transmitters again with redundancy and you'll notice here we have a little feedback loop for Doppler correction which we need to correct for um, our original design had us using VSAT modems and VSATs are mostly geostationary so they don't really have to deal with Doppler because their sats are fixed in the sky. Um, because we're a low Earth orbit, we'll probably see on the order of plus or minus 200 kilohertz of Doppler, which means that we have to correct it. All right, and then we, after looking into the USRP and GNU radio a little more, um, we came up with this. And obviously, this is much more elegant, much more integrated, and um, it would scale very well. Um, um, the, on the previous slide, these the previous slide, these modems are all on the order of thousands to even up to 10k um, dollars for each. They don't scale well. Every time you need a new one, you're going to buy a new one. And if we expect to be having multiple ground stations developing a constellation of satellites, um, that gets expensive really quickly. Here, everything, as I said, is simple and integrated. Um, it offers a ton of flexibility with the software-defined radio architecture. Um, one thing that we're unsure of is the performance and the amount of time it would take to learn GNU Radio um, and put this together. Um, unlike the lead times of the previous VSAT modems, um, the lead times for these usurps have been very low. In fact, because we are so close to Matt's shop, um, we've got it down to a couple of hours between the time that um, our... <laughs> purchasing department puts in the order and the time we walk there and pick it up. Mm -hmm. All right, so, and because we're a 
startup company, we decided to obviously take the risk and go with the um, software-defined radio architecture. Okay, so the rest of the talk will focus mainly on receiver design and I'll hopefully go through um, the blocks and some signals. So the receiver overview. We have a front end here that compensates for CIC response and provides IQ samples from the user. I don't know if you guys have um, plotted the input of the user on the spectrum analyzer, but maybe I was doing something wrong or not. Uh, but this, there's a CIC response present when I did it. So what I did was just add a FIR filter and compensate for that response. And that flattens it out a lot, which is important for some of the downstream blocks. Then we have a Doppler correction block here. This just compensates for that Doppler frequency shift that I talked about earlier. And our demodulator here extracts symbols from the IQ samples that come from the Doppler correction block and provides us with symbols the back end takes these symbols and turns them into a data stream. And the packetizer basically takes that data stream, puts some metadata onto it, and then ships it off to the next link in the chain. All right. And so I'll be focusing mostly on the demodulator and the back end because that's where all the interesting signal processing happens. So <clears throat> this, is, this should look familiar right now. I think I saw this about maybe three times today. But I'll walk through it anyway. So our resampler takes the input signal from the USRP and, or from the Doppler correction block and resamples it to 10 samples per symbol. We have a DC block here, automatic gain control. The frequency lock loop here provides for coarse frequency correction. Um, anything that the Doppler, this little Doppler correction really didn't take care of, um, we couldn't estimate Doppler accurately enough, so this takes care of any coarse frequency correction that remains. Uh, we have a symbol synchronizer that takes the samples and chooses the best symbol, passes that to a phase lock loop, which then, which then provides us carrier synchronization. And then it goes off to the adaptive equalizer, which kind of cleans up the constellation and makes it look as textbook as possible. All right, so I'll just go through the signals here. This spectrum is for our low rate radio. It's 16 kilobits per second. We expect to have about one kilohertz of accuracy from our Doppler correction block. And then on top of that, we'll probably have about 20 kilohertz of unknown due to frequency shifts in, synchron um, frequency shifts in synthesizers and things like that. So what I did here was I believe I offset this by um, 30 kilohertz just so I could, for the purpose of this demo. And you can see here at the edges, there's a slight compensation for the um, CIC response. Normally the response would look something like this, and then I'm kind of overcompensating here at the edges. Okay, so here I've well, resampled to 10 samples per symbol, and you can see that the resampler also provides some low pass filtering. <clears throat> then this is the output of the frequency lock loop. So you see between here and here, the main lobe is now centered. So that got rid of any of the coarse frequency um, offset. And now this is the same thing as this plot, just these are the IQ samples. And you see at this point we have 10 samples per symbol, so you can see the um, symbol transitions going through the center here. And then the output of the symbol synchronizer, here we've chosen the symbol that maximizes the eye opening. So we no longer have the symbol transitions. And then the output of the PLL um, remove or adds carrier synchronization. And then finally, we have the adaptive equalizer, which really cleans it up and makes it look nice. So um, you can see here that we still have a little bit of phase noise. But I mean, can't complain about this. All right, so once we get the actual symbols from the demodulator, what we do is we pass it into the back end. And what the back end does is we first estimate SNR here, and then we pass that through to our soft decision Viterbi decoder, and then to the differential decoder, and then finally we split it off. We pass the data um, through a T, and it splits between the packet framer, which then will pass spacecraft packets through the packetizer, and then a bit error rate meter for testing. And now that you've, I've explained the overall 
flow of our basic receiver, this is really where um, GNU Radio shines. So we started out with our basic de receiver design, and we have two rates. So I, I showed you the low rate earlier. Um, so all we have to do is, you know, instant instantiate that twice, change a little bit of numbers here and there, and we have ourselves a second receiver, and that costs us nothing. And then from there, we can add other tools that are useful for debugging and um, are very operator friendly. Okay, now a couple of slides on performance. So this is a standard bit error rate curve. What I have plotted down here is bit error rate versus um, EB over N0. So I measured it, I measured it with, I, I measured it four times. First we have BPSK uncoded. We have, then we have differentially encoded BPSK. Then we have coded BPSK. And then different, coded differentially encoded BPSK. So, and I also have the theor theoretical curves plotted on here as well. So you can see um, the non-coded curves look pretty good. We're right on there, maybe a couple tens of a dB off. And then our coded curves are slightly further away from theoretical. Um, but still, our target was 1 dB um, of implementation loss, so we are well within that. Um, I should note that these curves were generated completely in software because it is easy to accurately characterize noise or accurately add noise. And also our 16 kilobit per second um, link produces errors at about once per minute if I run it in real time. So that would be just a pain to generate numbers down here. Oh, and also with the, with the usurp in the loop, it adds another tenth or two, so we're not concerned about that, and we, we've proven the fact that this works pretty much as shown here. <clears throat> okay, and so the previous slide was for the 64 kilobit per second receiver. This is for the 16 kilobit per second receiver, and you can see that it's pretty much the same. All right, so another thing that's really important for a spacecraft receiver is lock time. So one thing we don't have the luxury of is something that's going to be in the sky all day long. So we can't um, turn on our radio and say, okay, we'll just come back after lunch and have this guy ready to go. We need to be able to acquire signal and lock on and demodulate instantly. So what this plot shows is a histogram of lock times over overnight test. And what I did here was I offset the transmit signal by 20 kilohertz, which is about the maximum we'd be seeing on orbit. And I ran um, some SNR sweeps from 2 dB or 5 dB of EB over N0, which is the, the worst case we ever expect to see, all the way up to 20. And you can see that we lock well within a second for our 64 kilobit per second receiver. Um, our low data rate receiver, as expected, takes a little bit longer to lock. Um, but still, it's, it's under a second in, I don't know, 99.49s um, of the time. And I, we just fit a gamma curve to here. Okay. So now, uh, some demonstrations. So this is a, a workflow that I kind of used um, when I first got into GNU Radio and, and started learning about it. Um, <laughs> working in a startup, you quickly realize that, you know, investors love demos. Um, people aren't going to give you millions of dollars based on nice-looking block diagrams. So eventually, at some point, you're going to have to prove something to them. And Gunner Radio is really good to us in this regard. Um, as you can see here, I was able to demo at virtually every single stage, and um, even at the beginning, we impressed a lot of people with our demos, so I'll go through a few of them. So this is our very first real demo that we put together. Um, GNU Radio ships with a lot of cool apps and it enable you capture or immediately capture some real world signals um, without having to be an expert or really know too much about it. So what we did here was we connected our ground dish to the USRP, and we had like a, a feed here. And all we did was run GR NOAA, and 
we are able to get this image, which is pretty cool if you think about it. Um, we're a satellite imaging company. We downlink the image from a satellite that's moving. The, um, the orbit statistics are sort of similar to ours, and you know this excited a lot of people in the company. So really without knowing much, spending some time with GNU Radio, I was able to do something pretty fancy, and this proved our, our, ground, hard, our ground hardware, the fact that we're able to track satellites, and as I said, a lot of people were very happy with this. So next, after spending some time prototyping and actually doing work and learning how to make signal processing blocks and lay out the receiver, well, the next big demo that we put involved or that we did involved sending commands from our ground software to our spacecraft um, computer, which would then execute the commands um, and send telemetry back to the ground. And we really wanted to include a radio link, but the spacecraft radios weren't um, developed yet, so fortunately, because I can't, let's say I'm a good software programmer, but I developed some unit tests for my ground software anyway, we basically had both sides of the link already there, so what we did was we just used two of our usurps, and we're able to demo that despite not having the spacecraft radio ready, and that was really cool. So you can see the two USRPs down here, and the setup, there's a big horn here just to make it wireless. People would get really impressed by wireless, you know, even though there's no difference between that and a cable. Okay, so <laughs> anyway, here, um, I'm gonna set up, hopefully this works. I tried to test it earlier. Um, what we have going on here is back at Skybox, I've set up the spacecraft radio. Um, there's a bunch of pat or attenuators in the loop going into the down converter, connected to a USRP, and then to the local host. And then we have a UDP stream connected here, which just um, exports GUI information, which is running on my laptop here. So, So that doesn't look like it's going to work, of course. Okay, that's unfortunate, but luckily I came with the backup plan. If I could. All right, so uh, before I came, I anticipated that that would happen. So what I did was I just captured that UDP stream that would normally be stre um, get streamed to us from whatever re remote ground station that we have. Um, so what you see here is the ground radio in action. I believe I'm transmitting at the low rate right now. Um, so you can see how quickly the receiver locks up. And we have a bunch of receiver status statuses here. Um, and also some data statistics here. This is not going to really show data just yet. 
um, because I'm sending packets, but I'm sending a packet about every 10 seconds, I believe. So we have some sync time that we've determined is adequate. And then we send our packet and then we stop transmitting. Um, so that's what you're seeing here. And that this means we transmitted the high rate receiver. So as you can see here, we have um, both the high rate receiver and low rate receiver running simultaneously. And we've just added a couple of bells and whistles to make this more user friendly. And between this and an actual real spectrum analyzer, there really hasn't been anything that we couldn't figure out yet in the field. Um, the only thing that we've really needed the real spectrum analyzer for is when we've been very wrong with our frequencies. Um, and that's just user error, really. So you can see how low this locks down to. Um, I think eventually I start sending a PN9 sequence and just running bit error, bit error tests on that at very low SNR for a low rate receiver. But I don't know if you guys want to keep look, watching this or not. <laughs> um, but Oh, and then we have this spectrum. Oh, I, that's, I should have showed you this earlier, but just to give you guys an idea of what kind of signals were, or I guess now it just changed. Yeah, so now it's getting better. And I believe this is where I start running the low bit rate test. And this is pretty amazing that with this signal quality, we can still get bit error rates of like, 10 to the minus 6 with um, convolution encoding, of course. OK. So that's the demo. Um, all right. All right, so in conclusion, um, GNU Radio has really been awesome to us. Um, as you saw, we've done a whole lot of it, a whole lot with it. We've impressed our um, investors. GNU Radio is awesome for prototyping, as people mentioned already. It's very easy to debug. You can insert um, plots or visualizers like I did at every point in your receive chain, every point in your transmit chain. Um, and we've actually got very low implementation loss, which is one of our concerns. So all in all, we're very happy with our decision to go down the software-defined radio path. Um, and a couple of improvements or feedback that we're looking to get was, one, our transmit flow control. So what we like to do is effectively transmit a random sequence when we have no packets, but be able to instantly interrupt that sequence when we do have packets. Right now, um, it seems that our GNU radio buffers are very deep. I know there was an email sent out on the list a while back about being able to change that at runtime. Um, but these are running in the same flow graph right now. So the thing is, we want our receive buffers to be very deep, but our transmit buffers to be very small. And I didn't quite think that was possible. I, please, someone please correct me if I'm wrong, because this would be wonderful. It is? OK. That's wonderful. Um, and then, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. So when I'm idling, I want to transmit, um, say I want to transmit a PN, another PN9 sequence when I'm not transmitting, but I want to immediately interrupt that as soon as I get a packet. Right now, I can accumulate, I don't know, seconds, maybe up to minutes of, uh, maybe not minutes, but a, a ton of stuff that I've just put in there because there's no um, flow control, or I didn't think there was at least. I guess I'll have to look into that. That's really good news. And then finally, the CIC compensation in the USERP. I don't know um, if that is available or um, right now we're, we're just implementing it ourselves.
All right. That's thing one, and about half your implementation loss is going to go away. Okay. You're amplifying the noise when you bring the edges up. Yep. Okay, so I, I think I, I actually read that on the list too, but I wasn't good about implementing it. But anyway, I believe Matt said that if your decimation rate is even, um, then you'll get the half band response. And or I believe there's two half band filters on there. Yeah, it's probably best for him to explain it. We get this question a lot. Um, so if you ch choose a sample rate which results in an odd decimation, you will have just half-band filters and you'll have roll-off. And really, you shouldn't, you, you shouldn't choose those sample rates. We, what's that? Oh, I'm sorry. If, if you choose an odd decimation ratio, so let's say uh, the sample rate you choose is 100 megahertz divided by 17, whatever that works out to That would be an odd sample rate and you will have no half-band filters, you'll only have CIC, and it'll have roll-off. And we've, we've discussed even not allowing you to choose those, because typically it's a bad idea, but we, we sort of let you do that it, just in case you need it for some particular application. But in general, you should choose something that is at least an even def, uh, decimation. So uh, let's say 100 megahertz divided by 50 would be an even number, and then you'll get one half-band filter. If you choose something that is a multiple of 4, so 100 divided by 48, let's say, that would give you two half-band filters, which would be even flatter. But at least one half-band filter, you, t you basically don't need to worry about the CIC roll-off. Um, so so you just, you just want to avoid the odd numbers. And it, it was more obvious back when you chose the decimation rather than, ch but UHD allows you to choose the sample rate instead, and so you don't you don't consciously see the decimation, and so it's not always obvious. And so um, we, we've thought about just disabling the odd ones, and or, or but we're going to put a warning in so that uh, it'll say, you know, you sure you really want this? Um, but if, if you again, if you choose even, or even better yet, multiple four, you don't have to worry about it. So that's going to compensate for some of your implementation loss because you won't be amplifying the noise. The other thing is 10 samples per baud is way overkill. Way overkill. So, the, so, so you're letting a lot of noise in the front end of your receiver. Depends on how you filter after that. But I don't know why you need 10 samples per baud. So, so we resample after that. Um, we actually know that's after resampling. We have 10 samples per symbol. Um, we need... That well, first Doppler, right? Um, we need to correct for Doppler, and we also have that uncertainty um, where we can have. I see. So you need the 10x to make sure the signal is exactly. in the passband. Okay. Do you speak a little more about what types of uh, or what methods you're using for the Doppler Okay. So, so the question was how we're going to correct for Doppler or how we plan on correcting for Doppler. So we have TLEs that will hopefully um, give us a pretty good idea of where our satellite is and accurately predict the Doppler. A two-line element. Sorry about that. Um, and a TLE two-line element. Uh, <laughs> so I'm really the wrong guy to be asking about that. But essentially, what I know is that I put this TLE into a black box that my GNC guy wrote, and that gives me Doppler. <laughs> <laughs> Two-line element is what you put into an orbital tracking program that allows you to track the satellite around the Earth. So then you know the vector between you and the satellite. If you know the vector between you and the satellite, you know the vo velocity between you and the satellite, so you know the Doppler between you and the satellite. You also know where to point your high-gain antenna. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Any other questions? How many satellites do have So we don't have any up. Just yet. Um, so we did have one plan, and it's past that date. Uh, apparently, with satellites, I've been told that you know you plan a launch expecting that it's going to slip. So it looks like we're going to be launching hopefully sometime early next year, but no one knows for sure. I'm. No, no, no. Our, ours is a little bigger, about 100 kilograms. Yeah. 
So we have two selected. Oh, the question was how many ground stations we have right now. We have two selected right now. Um, as we build a constellation, we'll obviously want more. But for now, we have two, which is sufficient for zero satellites, I guess.